Hi, everyone. It's absolutely fabulous to be here. I don't know where I'm not going to sit here. I won't be in behind that lantern either. And it's just a pleasure to be with you. I have so many, I can see so many friendly faces in the audience. And I'll refer to actually the work of some of the people in the audience has been essential in getting us to where we are here. So let me see if that works. You can see it up there. Um, so look, uh, as Ali was saying before, uh, we've been working at what we now call progressive marketing at Diageo for a number of years. And I suppose it's important to recognize, you may be familiar with who we are as a company, but I'll just give you a couple of pointers, I guess, uh, that I guess have to do with why this is happening or why this has happened or why this has gotten to the place that it has. And just a few pictures there of, you know, a few people in the team. Uh, a couple of them have mostly members of my team. And the point is, you know, it's a diverse place. As in many companies that operate in the world, it's only natural to encounter many cultures, people that come from different places, different realities and different histories. And so when you work in a place like that, I guess that the idea of understanding that different people have different needs, different experiences, different frameworks is more natural. And I've been lucky to be part of a team like that for a number of years. That said, the Agio put forward objectives on diversity, equity and inclusion that were really very big. And some of our statistics I recognize are quite significant. For example, the Agio today has almost 70% of female uh, board members, which is quite unusual. Uh, one of the pictures there is our CEO, Deborah Crew. And one of the few FTSE 100 female CEOs. Uh, we also have a female CFO. Uh, we have a few female. So in terms of gender, Diageo is truly very inclusive and very diverse. Um, and I think I wanted to show you this because one of the com com conversations that we have at, at our company is that we often go back in history to get inspiration. Uh, one of the richest experiences that one can have when you work for the Agile is to go to the archives and see what happened on a particular brand in the past. It's a phenomenal experience. And on this particular subject, there's so much work that has happened in many of our brands for many, many years. A few examples there uh, is Bailey's and their engagement with Sex in the City at a time where you're very young, but Sex in the City was pretty breakthrough at the time in terms of the portrayal of women and how they were owning their own narrative and being out there and their sexuality and all of that. Uh, you know, uh, Gareth being out there as a rugby player and coming out as gay, that was a big thing. And Guinness was were put out work in the world uh, to portray that. Um, this is a picture there on Smirnoff and uh, a deaf dancer. Uh, that was 2016, and I've got still my predecessor in the audience. She was, uh, you were the CMO at that time. Um, more recently, we've got work on Baileys, for example, that portrayed drag queens in a way that was truly re uh, representative. In fact, they were participants in understanding and, and putting out there what kind of, how they would be portrayed. And so those are some of the if I think about a few examples of work that happened now a few years back. But if I go forward um, and I show you a little bit of the journey, um, I think 2017-18 um, was an important year because in that year there was a very um, a desired um, actually per pursuit of in particular gender representation. And that led to a number of initiatives, um, a number of ac actions in regards to our agencies. Still, actually, you put out a letter uh, to the agencies to say, we want to know what is your representation, what kind of creative landscape you've got, how many women you've got, etc." And that was really, uh, in my opinion, a very, very important moment in time. Then moving on, we started working with Creative Equals and I think the first event was here in the UK. That was only the beginning. It has led to much more activity. 
uh, started with uh, women and creative comeback and Ali and team. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, it still is. And we now have gotten further. Uh, more recent work with Smirnov, we briefed a, a team of creatives with disabilities and the work has absolutely been phenomenal. I think I refer to our own teams and I just wanted to highlight the fact that in my mind, it's a back and forth kind of um, you know, reflection. Is the work you put out there and then how you are? Uh, how's your team? What are you thinking about it? How you trained? And to what extent that training and that awareness is truly significant in a very wide population. And uh, I think some of the, these interventions that we've had in terms of portrayal, um, in regards to gender, in regards to disabilities more recently, etc., have been really fundamental. So I won't take you through all the, the interesting milestones which have been phenomenal, but the point for me here is it truly is a journey. So even though I'm really proud of the work that we've done during these past years, and I just show you a few examples, the truth is I'm very conscious of the fact that this journey isn't over. And the notion of figuring out what else could we do, what are we doing that is working, what are we doing that is not quite working as we would like to, is really, really important. But that said, with all that journey, I just thought I'll share with you a few examples that are more recent of work that we're really proud of. And I've already referred to Smirnov, but um, I just wanted to <coughs> share this, this one example because we did this, this work here in the world actually, but one of the, the launch event here in, in London was phenomenal. I was lucky enough to attend it. You see Sh uh, Sinead Burke there. Uh, it was a whole, uh, and it is, the, the work is called We Do We and we do us, and it really is inclusive work. Uh, we've had a launch event here in London. Uh, we partnered with an on-trade group, and the idea behind <coughs> it is, obviously you can imagine, our work has a lot to do with bars and restaurants. And this is a phenomenal, important experience for people, and oftentimes that experience is hindered by the fact that a lot of people cannot enjoy that experience for many reasons you're visually impaired, there's you know, physical disabilities of various kinds. And at that launch event that we had of this campaign, it was portrayed, what could we do to really address those things with a partner um, here in G the largest on-trade group here in GB. It was a fantastic, fantastic experience. And I can tell you, it really opens your eyes in terms of what other things could we do. So that's one. I also wanted to talk about whiskey momentarily. I know you've just uh, had a conversation about men and masculinity, and I thought I'll show you this picture because I worked in whiskey for many, many years. Many years back, if I had asked maybe myself or others, if you imagined the consumers of whiskey in the world, how would they look like? And maybe they used to look like this. Um, this is, of course, an image that portrays the 60s, so it's quite old. But nevertheless, not that long ago, we were still encountering that kind of portrayal of the whiskey drinker. That is, of course, not great uh, from the perspective of, you know, including the other 50%, if at least. Uh, and so we've done a ton of work on across many brands. And I just put a couple of uh, examples here of uh, one was on Singleton, work that we've done here in GB. The other one is on uh, Johnny Walker, uh, Umami, which is a very high-end version of uh, Johnny Walker Blue Label, uh, Delicious. And we've done work with, you can see that there's a portrayal of women partnership with Monica Galetti that speaks to whiskey in the context of a different occasion. Of course, she is a chef. She talks a lot about flavor. And so you can then imagine how these whiskeys are going to be enjoyed in a context that is different from the one that would be imagined with the image that I showed you earlier. This in turn has been really, really important in terms of having more women come into this category and specifically our brands. And I thought, you know, it's also, we've done a lot of work on gender, uh, uh, you know, in many aspects, but one of the things that for me has been a big aha and I thought I'll share this with you because it's so relevant today, but is the, one of the possibilities of technology in really neutralizing biases 
Now, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, Gen AI and uh, will it really bring biases forward and so forth. But here's an example of how you can use tech in a way that really suspends everything but the subject matter at hand. And in this case, it's flavor. So we put out a, a program, it's called Watch Your Whiskey. And what it does is really ask people questions about flavor preferences. So, you know, do you like apple pie? Do you like cinnamon? Do you like spicy food? Based on your answers, it will recommend you a whiskey that this algorithm thinks you're going to enjoy. And guess what? This has been really, really successful. We've launched this program across many markets around the world. We had to adapt the language to refer to flavors in ways that were appropriate for people from India, people from China, but the concept behind it is exactly the same. And what that does is, then it doesn't matter that you, you know, which gender you have or whatever, what age group you are, you will be welcomed by the fact that it is your flavor that is going to really inform the choices that are put forward to you. So that said, if this is content, I think it's really, really important to also think about the canvas of that content. And the canvas of that content oftentimes is media. And we've done a lot of work on progressive media, not just on pro portrayal, but what is the media, what are the platforms in which our content and our experiences is going to live. Here are three different examples of different aspects. Um, one is Black and Irish. It's a podcast in Ireland, as the name can tell. Um, it speaks to you know, different groups of people uh, in Ireland, and this has grown quite substantially in recent times. The middle picture there is a publication in Spain. It's called Shanghai. It started as a small publication. It's now a, a wider uh, environment of, of media, and it's really very inclusive of LGBT communities. <coughs> And the third one uh, is a TV uh, station in Kenya that really makes a very substantive effort in portraying sports um, for disabled people. And so these are a few examples, but to me, the important message within is think about the media landscape as well. Because the truth is, you might think at times that these publications or these media forums are relatively niche, and yet, and I'll show you a couple of stats later on, they can really be very, very valuable to deliver your message because the engagement in those platforms can be much greater. Within the media context, one of the aspects that I thought I'll share with you, it's so uh, you know, thematic and we've, we've, there's a lot of conversation around women in sport. And I thought, let me share you a little bit of an example, particularly on Guinness. So Guinness is a brand that has been working on rug with rugby for a number of years. Um, and you know, for, for a few years back, we were conscious of the fact that there were women playing rugby and Guinness wanted to participate in enhancing the experience of the viewer in regards to other, other person looking for you know, doing any search on uh, rugby players, female rugby players. So we did work with people like Meta or people like Wikipedia to portray the female rugby players in a way that is a lot more you know, fundamentally uh, rounder, better informed, more accessible, et cetera, et cetera. And last December, uh, we announced our championship of not just the Six Nation uh, men, but also the female. Uh, and this was a fantastic piece of news. Everyone was, couldn't be more delighted of the fact that that is happening. And in the context of what we've known, which is effectively the portrayal of women in sports on the general uh, media is relatively small in comparison with what it actually represents. We wanted to do something about that. So we had a launch event again here in London uh, with loads of media present, more than 200 uh, media houses present. And he had a really fantastic um, you know, perception and viewership, which I think is really phenomenal. There's so much work that we can do in that space. But uh, you know, not only that, but I think it's really important to, um, to have a look at you know, what else can we do. 
And in this instance, one of the big important, besides that event that I told you about, we did a campaign that says, uh, you know, Six Nations isn't over when the male championship is over. In fact, it lasts until the end of this month. And I'm told if you're a fan of uh, rugby, you can view the, uh, uh, a game this Saturday on BBC One and BBC iPlayer 420. Um, and I think it's really, really valuable. The fact that as a, as if you're a rugby fan, you will enjoy this game for another month by viewing uh, the, the female championship, which is phenomenal. So I talked about gender a lot in terms of rugby, but I think importantly, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, if, if you think about that journey, recognizing that gender is one of the big milestones, but it's not the only one, and the team on Guinness is working a lot on the experience at the stadiums. There's also thinking about the experience of the viewers. And one of the projects that was launched this year had to do with the fact that uh, blind and visually impaired people, even though they are present in front of the TV, oftentimes listening to the radio, the experience of that game is not as rich as it could be. So in two matches this year, Guinness tested this new you know, this new <laughs> adventure, I suppose, where there's live descriptions for the games. And I think it is really great to embrace ideas of that nature. It may not be perfect from the beginning, uh, you know, it may have its difficulties, but it's really worth its while. And not just for the viewers, but I think if you're being inclusive more broadly, again, this brand is doing a lot of work at the stadiums to ensure that, in this case, the uh, blind and visually impaired people can have an experience there, and so Guinness is training staff, and I'm, I think it's also fair to say that we're doing some of this work with Creative Equals. So, you know, to those of you, if, if some of you in the audience have been involved with this work, it's been a fabulous, uh, you know, experience, and I'm grateful and delighted that that is the case. I mentioned <coughs> a couple, I'll give you a couple of stats, um, and, and here's two. One is, I've talked a lot about Guinness in GB, so I may as well say that this year we achieved the number one beer in this country, uh, which we're delighted about. And it's getting more women into the franchise, um, you know, 24% more. And so this is not a coincidence. This is really the result of the kind of work that I'm talking to you about. It will just, the aperture of the brand just gets wider when you do this work, and therefore, it's really good for business. The second stat, I talked about uh, media and uh, progressive media, and media that is perhaps at times seen as less mainstream and therefore potentially more niche, and what comes with more niche is the idea that it's going to have a smaller return on investment, and I just wanted to share with you the fact that when you look, this is what we've learned, when you look at like for like channel mix, in fact, you can actually get up to 59% greater ROI. So it's not on everything, it's not every time, you have to work at it, but it is possible. So it's really worth it. My advice to you is, again, just think with an open mind about what can you do because it will make a big difference. So with all of that, I guess I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts. Thought number one, Really, 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 it comes to the idea, which I know is exceedingly basic, but think about your consumers and your teams as, I mean, <coughs> essentially people, and people of all nature. Uh, and that is a way to really have this inclusive mindset be very natural to you and your teams. I suppose my biggest learning is be willing to learn because you're going to start doing things that maybe you haven't done before. The other aspect is, even if now you've got you know, a good practice on aspects of this whole uh, you know, work, it may not all be perfect yet, or it may not all be as inclusive as you would like it to be. And therefore, being open-minded to the what else, what comes next, we've done this, or we've done this at this scale, could it be at that scale? How do we go about that? It's really rewarding. So that would be my kind of um, offer to you. But the last one is, if this sounds 
in any way, shape or form difficult, just be aware of the fact that you're not alone. And there's a lot of people out there that, is going to, that are going to be willing to participate, lean in. At this point in time, I've got fabulous experiences and I've acknowledged creative equals already, but I'll do it again. Uh, the UN and Stereotype Alliance, you saw Sarah before, you know, we're founding members. There's phenomenal people, phenomenal resources that are going to be more than willing to work with you to make a massive difference. So I'll just leave you with that. And I couldn't possibly avoid uh, using these two words <laughs> because really it is a journey and we will keep walking. Thank you. Thank you.